guys for coming out tonight for the second last of our Birds of Newfoundland uh, webinars. So the last one will be next Monday, April 24th. Uh, and Jenna will be teaching us about birding by ear, um, which is honestly a lot of fun uh, and a skill that you can start to learn pretty quickly and then it can take you a whole lifetime to, to polish it up. So uh, might as well get going now, I figure. Um, and Jenna has lots of tips and tricks to share. So I hope we'll see you for that. Um, okay, I am, yeah. If everyone could just keep themselves muted unless they have a question, um, that would be great just because we do have a few people here tonight. Um, so I think probably most of you know who I am and who Jenna is by now, uh, but just in case we have any new arrivals tonight, my name is Catherine Dale and coordinator of the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. And with us also tonight is Jenna McDermott, the assistant coordinator, um, and she will be keeping an eye on the chat and uh, answering questions kind of as we go along. Uh, but you'll also have an opportunity to ask questions at the end and uh, you know you or Jenna can feel free to interrupt me if there's a burning question that you need to know right now because uh, chances are if you're wondering it somebody else is probably wondering it as well. Uh, both Jenna and I work for an organization called Birds Canada, which also all of you are probably also familiar with now. Uh, but just in case, if, again, if we have anyone new here tonight, uh, Birds Canada is Canada's voice for birds. So we're the leading science-based bird conservation organization in the country. And our mission is to advance the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of Canada's wild birds and their habitats. This is obviously a huge job. Um, Canada is a large country. And one of the ways we do this, probably the main way we do this, is through citizen science programs. Uh, so these are programs that engage the skills and support of volunteers just like yourselves, uh, who donate their time and their energy and their enthusiasm to collect data on Canada's birds for a variety of programs. And so each year, Birds Canada programs uh, engage more than 70,000 volunteers across Canada, which is kind of a mind-boggling number. Uh, here in Newfoundland, we have two programs that we are currently running. We're, uh, our big program, kind of our main focus, is the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas, and that is what we are going to be talking about today. Um, so I won't go into detail about it now, except to say that we are aiming to map the distribution of all of the breeding birds on the island of Newfoundland. Um, but before I get into detail about that program, I'll just touch on the other program that uh, we run here, and that is the Atlantic Nocturnal Owl Survey. Um, and that is actually happening right now. Um, so the OWL survey is a route-based roadside survey. So volunteers take on a route of 10 stops. And on one evening between the 1st of April and the 15th of May, they go out along that route and they stop at each point and they use a playback track that we have, which combines silent listening and OWL calls and they record all OWLs they hear and see. Um, it's a really fun survey. It's great for beginners because we don't have that many nocturnal owls here in Newfoundland. And so there aren't, it's not an overwhelming amount of information to learn. Um, so if you're interested, actually this year, we, we currently have um, 65 routes on the island of Newfoundland. And it looks like we're going to be adding five new routes this year, uh, as well as possibly a new route in Labrador, where we currently have only four routes. Um, so we've done really well. Um, I'm excited to see the data come in this year. We are still trying to have a few routes uh, to, to cover. Um, so we have a few routes that you can actually see right in the middle there near Grand Falls, Windsor, which are along um, dirt roads, which aren't in great condition for vehicles at the moment. So they would require somebody with a side-by-side -side or an ATV. Uh, so if you happen to have one of those and you're interested in taking on one of those routes, uh, let me know because those are the last ones that we're looking to assign this year. Um, similarly, we are always looking to develop new routes. As you can see, that's a map of our current coverage on the island of Newfoundland. Uh, we do have some pretty big gaps, particularly in the Bay Vert area, on the Northern Peninsula, and in the Bay Despera area. So uh, if anyone's interested in establishing an owl route, reach out to me. Um, I, you can't see Labrador on that map, but I'm sure you can imagine that with only four routes on in the entirety of Labrador, we have pretty much all gap in Labrador. So if you happen to live in Labrador and are interested in doing a route, likewise, get in touch with me. Um, and then just a couple of other administrative things before we move on. The Breeding Bird Atlas is a huge project. Uh, we would not be able to do it without the support and help of our partner organizations, uh, which include Environment and Climate Change Canada, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, Memorial University, the Stewardship Association of Municipalities, and the Eastern Habitat Joint Venture. As, um, and then we have a number of other supporter organizations which have provided financial or in-kind support 
Uh, and without all of these organizations working together, this project could not be happening. Uh, and finally, the lands where we're conducting the Breeding Bird Atlas are the ancestral homes of the Beothic, whose people have been erased forever. Additionally, the island of Newfoundland is the unceded traditional territory of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq people. These people have been protecting and stewarding the land here since time immemorial. Through the work of the Breeding Bird Atlas, we do hope to continue this, uh, we hope to contribute to the stewardship and the effort to protect all the species we share the island with. So Birds Canada does understand that Indigenous voices, knowledge, and ongoing work on the land are critical for wild birds to thrive in sustainable ecosystems. We support the needs, aspirations, and rights of Indigenous peoples to care for the land. Okay, so uh, I don't have a poll for this uh, for this particular image, but if anybody knows what this is, you can feel free to put it in the chat. Um, so I always start with a story about this guy. Does anybody anybody have an answer in the chat uh, for what that might be? Even the jet, okay, Ellie, yes, some kind of thrush. Yes, you've already narrowed it down to the family, excellent. Okay, so what kind of thrush? We really don't have huge numbers of options. Okay, so we have one person saying Barbara saying gray cheek thrush, Shell saying hermit, Judy saying Swainson's, Ellie saying Swainson's. Um, okay, well, you know, right off the bat, you got three species of thrush that we have in Newfoundland. The only one you missed is Beery, and we don't have very many of those. So excellent job. Um, there does seem to be a little bit of uh, disagreement on what kind of thrush we have. Um, this is a gray cheek thrush, uh, and the primary way you would tell that is that it doesn't have a lot of markings on its face, and it doesn't have those spectacles, those buffy spectacles that the Swainson's thrush has, and it doesn't have that reddish tail that the hermit th uh, thrush has. But I agree, this one does look like he's got a bit of an eye ring, so I could see how he might be easy to mistake for a Swainson's thrush. So I always start the, start the atlas story with the gray cheek thrush, um, and that's because the gray cheek thrush that we have in Newfoundland are actually a unique subspecies of gray cheek thrush. So uh, for those people who were at our species at risk workshop a couple of weeks ago, um, you may remember that our Newfoundland subspecies is genetically distinct. Um, so even though gray cheek thrush are distributed all across uh, the rest of North America, our subspecies, the Newfoundland gray cheek thrush is, it's, is managed separately. Uh, and so in 2005, the Canadian Wildlife Service asked Derek Whitaker, who was a biologist a uh, Newfoundland biologist at the time and is currently a biologist for Parks Canada uh, working in Gros Morne. So Derek was asked to formally evaluate the population status of this subspecies. If we have this unique subspecies here, you know, what is going on with them? Should we be worried about them? And the reason they asked Derek to do this is because birders were saying they were seeing many fewer individuals of this once common species. Uh, but we didn't really have any evidence to back it up. So Derek was asked to kind of look into it. However, when he took on the task, he didn't realize just how difficult it would be. Um, in the 70s and early 80s, we had a number of breeding bird surveys done in Newfoundland, which are different than the breeding bird atlas. They're a little bit more like the owl survey in that they are route based with uh, 50 stops along a route. And so these were done in the 70s and 80s. And at the time, gray cheek thrush were relatively common along these routes. Uh, however, most of the surveys in Newfoundland stopped uh, around 1984. And so it was really kind of impossible to determine whether this anecdotal evidence that we were getting from birders, that there were fewer gray cheek thrush around, whether that was actually represented by, uh, whether it was representative of fact or whether people were just not, uh, not necessarily detecting them as well, or whether perhaps they had shifted their habitat, all kinds of other explanations. Uh, so without these, the data from the Breeding Bird Survey, we really didn't know. However, in 2005, Canadian Wildlife Service actually worked to reinstate, or sorry, in the early 2000s, I apologize, they uh, worked to reinstate the Breeding Bird sur Surveys in Newfoundland. And so in 2010, Derek went back and tried to do this population evaluation again. And what he found with data from the newest breeding bird surveys um, is that the great cheek thrush population had declined almost 95% in coastal parts of Newfoundland over 40 years. So our subspecies of great cheek thrush is currently listed as threatened under our Provincial Endangered Species Act. Uh, and it is currently being evaluated for federal status um, and Jenna is actually doing some of that work herself. 
So the reason I like to start talks with this story, it's obviously not a great story for the great chief thrush, uh, but it is a really good illustration of why we need solid baseline data about the distribution, the abundance and the health of bird populations. We can't know what we're losing or sometimes what we're gaining if we don't know what's out there. Uh, and unfortunately, on the island of Newfoundland, we often lack that baseline information. And that's really, obviously, where what I'm leading up to here is that's where breeding bird atlases come in. So what is a breeding bird atlas? You guys have heard me talk about it a lot. The formal definition is a comprehensive systematic assessment of the distribution and abundance of breeding bird species in a jurisdiction over a five-year period. So here in Canada, uh, those jurisdictions are usually provinces. Um, in the case of Newfoundland and Labrador, it's half a province, so we're only doing the island of Newfoundland. Um, and that was also done in Quebec, so uh, the Quebec Breeding Bird Atlas covers southern Quebec, but not northern Quebec. They're still working on that one. So those three pictures there are of actual hardcover breeding bird atlases that are physical books. And that is indeed what we used to produce. However, more recently, we have moved to online breeding bird atlases. Um, partly this is to reduce the cost of printing, but also this makes the information much more accessible for everyone. Um, and these online books are, are really very intuitive to use and uh, really kind of neat to look at. So this is our most recently completed example, uh, which is the Breeding Bird Atlas from Manitoba, which was completed, uh, data was collected between 2010 and 2014. And so when you go to the homepage, this is what it looks like. And the core of the atlas is uh, you can, when you drop down that tab, it gives you the option to see species accounts. So for every species that was found breeding in the province of Manitoba, we have a page like this. So you have a picture of the species, which is often taken by an atlaser. Uh, you have a little bit of a write-up about the species, which you can see on the right there. And then we have these maps that are on the bottom left. And I'm really just going to focus on two of them. Uh, which is the breeding evidence map and the relative abundance map. So for the breeding evidence map, those little squares indicate places where bobolinks have been uh, observed and the color indicates how sure we are that those observations represent breeding evidence. So the lighter colored squares mean it could be breeding there, it's possible. Orange squares mean it's probably breeding there and red squares mean we have confirmed breeding. And we'll talk about how you do that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, the other map that you see there is the relative abundance of bobolinks. So what is the density? How many, uh, how many bobolinks are you getting? And you can see that it does uh, vary from the, you know, it is quite different from the breeding evidence map. So if you really want to see a bobolink in Manitoba, you can see that you would sort of be in the southern, southern central part of the province underneath the, the, uh, the lakes there. The other thing that I think is really, really cool about uh, having an online atlas is you can look at the data by species, but the other really cool thing you can do is you can look at the data by place. So for example, let's say you're going on a vacation to Churchill, Manitoba, and you want to know what birds you might see in the Churchill, Manitoba area. You can look at the map, discover which atlas square Churchill is in, and then you can ask for a list of the species that were reported in that square. Um, and so you can actually get the data summarized by place. And that's not something you can do with the physical books. So that's a really neat feature of these online atlases. Now we can combine data from all of our different breeding bird atlases to get a picture of um, the distribution of some of our uh, species of national concern at a national level. Um, so for example, this is the map for the rusty blackbird and it contains data from all of those breeding bird atlases listed across the bottom. So from BC, from Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec and the Maritimes. Um, however, you may notice uh, that there are, according to this map anyway, no rusty blackbirds in Newfoundland or Labrador, or in fact, the Northern part of Quebec. Um, and uh, those of you who were at last week's webinar will know that that is not the case. We do have rusty blackbirds. Uh, but we don't have an atlas for Newfoundland yet, so we haven't been able to contribute our observations to that, those national maps just yet. We are the only province that lacks a modern bird atlas, um, and so at the moment, 
we are in a, we're a gap in our understanding of the status and distribution of birds at a national scale. Um, and so this map is obviously a little bit out of date uh, because the Saskatchewan Breeding Bird Atlas has actually been completed since this map was made. So they wrapped up uh, their data collection a couple of years ago. So we're, we're kind of the only gap left right now. Um, and, you know, this is important, not just because we want to understand the distribution of our birds at a national scale, but also because Newfoundland is important for birds. Uh, so we have some of the largest and most important seabird colonies in the world. Uh, so for example, for Leech's storm petrel, we have the largest colony in the world on Bakaloo. We have the largest uh, North American colony of Atlantic puffins uh, in Whitless Bay. And we also have unique subspecies of birds. So things like the great cheek thrush and the red crossbill. Um, and so it's really important that we understand what's going on with our unique, uh, unique subspecies of birds. And then finally, we are also likely to experience significant impacts of climate change. Uh, and we may see some pretty dramatic range shifts in some of our boreal breeding species. So it's really important for us to establish a baseline of species distributions now so that we can look at how it changes in the future. And this is exactly what we are trying to do. Uh, so as I said in the acknowledgement, uh, this is the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas is a uh, collaborative effort amongst all of these partner organizations at the top. But the most important partner is the citizen scientists. Uh, the success of the Atlas depends almost entirely on volunteer birders going out to uh, see what they can see and submitting their observations to our database. So our goal with the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas is to map the distribution and the abundance of Newfoundland's breeding birds uh, between the years, the summers of 2020 and 2024. Uh, so this summer that is coming up will be our fourth and second last year of data collection. Uh, next summer, the summer of 2024, will be our final year. So we're getting down to crunch time here. Uh, the peak season for data collection for the Breeding Bird Atlas is the 7th of June to the 7th of July. And that's because that is when the largest number of birds in Newfoundland breed. That doesn't mean that we don't have birds that breed outside of that time window, and we definitely do. Uh, so the reason, for example, that we do the owl survey now is because owls are very early breeders. Uh, similarly, things like Canada jays are very early breeders. Things like cedar waxwings and American goldfinch are late breeders. So we accept data for the breeding bird atlas year round. Um, we're just interested in, uh, in when things are breeding. So if you see something, if you see evidence of breeding in the winter for some of our winter breeding species, we want that information. However, because most birds are summer breeders, uh, where 7th of June to the 7th of July is our real crunch time. So how do you atlas an island the size of Newfoundland or a province the size of Saskatchewan, for example? Um, all atlases have the same basic design here in Canada. So we, they are made up of what we call atlas squares. So you start by dividing your jurisdiction into 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer squares. Uh, and here in Newfoundland, we have 1,485 squares in total. We then group those squares into administrative regions, um, which is done partly because those regions are uh, managed by volunteer regional coordinators. Uh, and so essentially they work with us to try and help coordinate effort within those regions. Uh, and they tend to know the birders and the birds of their region. And then we do recognize that it's very unlikely that we will be able to fully survey 1,485 squares. Uh, and so we have given some squares priority. And these squares aren't given priority because they are particularly interesting in and of themselves. Really, as you can see, really, if you look at the map, the black squares indicate high priority squares, and then the open squares or open circles indicate uh, secondary priorities. And so you can see that we did it in a pretty systematic way. Uh, one in every four squares was a high priority square, and one in every four squares was a second priority square, uh, essentially. Um, and then we did a little bit of rejigging to make sure we had enough coverage of the shorelines. Um, so there's nothing innately special about these squares, but what we want to try and do is ensure that we don't get some areas that are completely covered, like the Avalon Peninsula, and then some areas that have no coverage whatsoever. So instead of having a lot of focus spread out across a whole bunch of squares, or as is sometimes the case, some really popular squares with tons and tons and tons of focus on them, we try to ensure even coverage by designating some squares as priority. 
So the types of data that you can collect, there are three types of data that I'm going to talk about today, but I'm going to spend the most time on general atlasing. Um, first, though, and perhaps, perhaps the most widely used is incidental observations. And this is essentially any bird, anywhere, anytime, as long as you're not out actually birding. If birding is not the primary purpose uh, that you are out for that day, then what you are submitting is an incidental observation. So, uh, you know, let's say you're out for a drive and you happen to see a duck with ducklings in a pond at the side of the road. You can report that as an incidental observation. Um, there's no time limit on it, but primarily we get incidental observations from late May to mid-August for the reasons I outlined before. Uh, that's when the majority of our birds breed. That data provides information about presence. So if you happen to see a loon, for example, with, um, with fledglings uh, in the middle of a pond, it tells us that there is a loon breeding in that square. It does not tell us anything about whether loons are breeding in adjacent squares. So it doesn't give us absence data. So for absence data, what we're really looking for is more general atlasing data. And essentially what this is, is a, a square level search. So that image there is a map of one of those 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer squares that I showed you. And within each of those squares, our target is to have between 12 and 20 hours of birding. So if, for example, you have, I don't know, one or two birders who spend 17.5 hours between them in this square over five years, and neither of them ever see a loon, then we can be a little bit more confident that probably loons aren't breeding in that square. So that's that information that provides us both presence and absence information because we are putting in the effort to see if we can find things. And if we don't find them, then then we can we can be a little more confident that in fact they are not there. Um, similar to the incidental observations, this occurs primarily from late May to mid-August. Um, and uh, what we ask people to do, um, so for each square, you can generate one of these little maps. And what this map does is it shows you the roads within the square, uh, but it also shows you the different types of habitat present. And so uh, in this particular square, you can't really see the categories there, but I'll, I'll enlarge them for you. Um, we have about 43% broadleaf forest, relatively little coniferous forest, only 2%, 37% uh, mixed wood forest, 12% shrubland, and then water and a little bit of barren, sparsely vegetated area and a little bit of developed area. And so what we ask that volunteers do as best they can is try to divide their time between those habitat types somewhat proportionally. So if, for example, you were searching this square, you would not want to spend all of your time in the shrubland because shrubland only represents a small part of the square. One thing that we do with our squares, but is not strictly necessary, um, is if people are interested in a particular area or frequently in a particular area, they can actually sign up for a square. Um, so basically that square gets assigned to them. And what that means is that as an atlaser, you are committing to complete the 12 to 20 hours of general atlasing over the five year period of the atlas. Now at this point you would be committing to complete 12 to 20 hours of birding over the next two years, um, but it could be spread out over the two years. Uh, but if you are assigned to a square, it does not mean that you can only submit data for that square, and it doesn't mean that other people can't also submit data from your square. Um, and what square assignments do is they're managed by regional coordinators, and generally speaking, they help us organize effort but they are not required. So you can submit incidental observations from anywhere. You can also submit your birding effort in a square without being signed up for it. So I really wanna emphasize that you don't need to take on a square, um, but if you're interested in doing so, we certainly have lots of squares that we would be happy to assign. The third type of data is point counts. Um, and that's basically exactly what it sounds like. You stand at a predetermined location and you record all of the birds you see and hear during a specific time period, which in our case is five minutes. Um, our point counts are really important because they let us generate that abundance map, that relative abundance map I showed you uh, back on the, the website from the Manitoba Breeding Bird Atlas. So we need the point counts to generate relative abundance data. 
Um, however, they do require a more specialized protocol and skill set because uh, they do require that you recognize all birds by sight and sound. And birds, as we've made the point many times, um, they're more likely to be heard than seen. Uh, and so really with point counts, you need to sort of, you, you need to be able to recognize them by ear. Um, so I'm not going to really talk that much about point counts, although I'm happy to share a little bit more information if people are interested. Um, I will say that where you do point counts uh, is actually um, information that's provided on the Atlas Square Map. So what we are aiming for is 15 point counts per square. And a certain number of those point counts, at least in a square with a road, will be on road point counts. So for this particular square, you can see that predefined or on road point counts, we're looking for 10. And off road point counts, we're looking for five. So the on road point counts should happen at these points that you can actually see on the map. Um, you will notice right away there are more than 10 of them. So they certainly go up to 26. They actually go all the way up to 30 in this square. However, you're not expected to do all 30 points. What you would do if you were doing point counts in this square is you would aim to uh, do the first 10 points. So you would do point number one, point number two, not necessarily in that order, but you would do points one through 10 and not do any of the higher numbers. Unless one of those points, so for example, let's say point number eight, it's right in the middle of the map there and it's right on highway 330. And let's say that when you go to do point number eight, you find that there's really no place to pull off on the side of the road there and it's not safe. In that case, you would say, okay, I'm not gonna do point number eight. I'm gonna do points one through seven. Then I'm gonna do nine, 10, and I'm gonna add point 11 to make up for point eight, which I didn't do. So that's how you choose which of those points you are actually going to stop at and do a point count at. Then you have the number of off-road point counts. Those you choose the location yourself, but you follow the habitat guidance. So uh, if you look there right underneath the list of coordinates, you see the number of off-road point counts. And for this square, it's asking for four in the wetland and one on the barrens. And you can see those habitat types on the map. And so what you would do is place those off-road point counts uh, ahead of time. So what we don't want you to do is go out, wander through a wetland, wait till you hear something really interesting and do a point count at that location. Rather, you would in advance say, I think I can get to this wetland area, place the point count there, uh, and then you would basically take a GPS or put um, mark the point on your phone and uh, go stand at that point and do your point count. Uh, point counts that are off-road need to be at least 100 kilometers, 100 kilometers, that would be a long walk, 100 meters off the road, and uh, they need to be, each point needs to be at least 300 meters from another point. So those are sort of the parameters you need to think about when you're placing points. Now, as I said, point counts require a pretty specialized skill set. Certainly, there's something that I am still very much learning to do. Um, and Jenna will teach us all about uh, birding by ear next week, but probably most of us won't learn quite fast enough to be doing point counts this season. But if it's something you're interested in doing, there is another option, and that is to collect bioacoustic data. So this is essentially collecting bird survey data through audio recordings, so through sound. Um, and what we have here are handheld zoom recorders. This is the one that I've been taking out. Uh, he's wearing a nice little fuzzy windscreen hat. Um, I named him Atticus because he seemed to have a whole lot of personality. Uh, so you take out the little handheld zoom recorder, uh, you take out the windscreen and the tripod, you put it up at the point that you have decided to do your point count at, you hit record and you collect a five minute recording. And we can use that, we can go through that later and transcribe the data and use that as a point. Um, so it's a really great way for people who maybe aren't feeling confident in uh, identifying, uh, you know, identifying birds by ear. They can still participate. They can still do point counts. And as I said, point counts are really important for the atlas. Um, likewise, if you are starting to learn to bird by ear, but you're not fully confident yet, and that was definitely me, um, then it's really nice to have one of these with you because then you can go back and listen to anything that really kind of threw you for a loop during the point count. And you can, you can sort of make sure that you got everything. Um, the other thing about Zoom recorders is that they're, they're kind of fun to carry around. Uh, so this is our friend Atticus roasting a hot dog one day in the field. Um, detailed information on setup and collecting data 
using these Zoom recorders is available on the website. Um, so the Zoom recorders come from the Atlas office or for, from the regional coordinators. We have a number available to loan out. We're very, very happy to loan them to people. Um, we'll talk about how to use them with you. And then it's really just a matter of making sure that you're following the instructions because we have had some cases of, uh, for example, people forgetting to identify where they are and then we aren't able to use the recording. Uh, so that's the really the important thing to remember when you're using a Zoom recorder is just to follow the instructions. Okay, so we're gonna move on now from how you collect data and what kind of data you collect to specifically what data are you collecting? And the unifying theme, um, as you can see in these, these four photos, it's not just what species are you seeing, but also what they're doing. So atlasing is really birding, but with a focus on behavior. With each birding observation you provide, you also provide a breeding evidence code. Um, and without that code, without you saying what the bird is doing when you see it, um, that's the the information is less useful to us uh, because we really need to be able to associate observations with the probability of this species is breeding there. So what constitutes breeding evidence? Uh, we have a whole bunch of codes. These are available on the website, but I'm actually going to go through them now as well. Um, because often when people think of evidence of breeding, the first thing they jump to is nests. You know, if you can find a bird nest, that's evidence that it's breeding. And that is very true, but there are, there are lots of other ways we can know that a bird is breeding in the area, or at least that it's likely breeding in the area. Um, and some of these codes may seem rather simple, and then you go to apply them in the field, and it turns out to be more complex. Uh, so I'm just going to go through them quickly. And, uh, and then some of our quiz today is going to be focused on breeding evidence codes, just to talk about some of the tricky situations. Uh, so our first code is actually a lack of breeding evidence code, really. And that's if you see a bird, uh, but it's not during the breeding season or it's not in suitable nesting habitat, you would just give it an X. So this is kind of one of our classic examples, happens all the time, happened to me today. Let's say you see a ring-billed gull, but it's in a parking lot. It's in the Costco parking lot, for example. Ring-billed gulls, probably not breeding in the Costco parking lot. Definitely eating, probably not breeding. Um, and so we would just give that an X for observed. It's a ring-billed gull, it's in the parking lot, it's around, but we really can't associate any probability of breeding with it. The rest of our breeding evidence codes are, are organized into three different levels. So the first is possible, and we have two codes associated with that. The first and lowest breeding evidence code is H, and that means that the species is observed in suitable nesting habitat during their breeding season. So an example here would be this black-throated green warbler, which is in breeding habitat. It's in a deciduous tree. Uh, we know they build their nests in trees. It could very likely be breeding, but it's not singing. It's not doing anything other than hopping around in that tree. We would give that an H for poss possible breeding. It's in habitat. Um, some of you are probably wondering, and you'll notice that all of these breeding evidence codes share the uh, common denominator of all finishing with during the species breeding season. Uh, so some of people may be wondering how you can know when a species breeding season is. Um, and we do actually uh, have a partial answer to that. Uh, so very painstakingly, Jenna went through a lot of information uh, generated partly from Project Nestwatch and partly from species accounts about various uh, different species that breed in Newfoundland. And so we have an estimate of the breeding dates, the range of breeding dates for all of our species here in Newfoundland. Uh, it was compiled on relatively little data from Newfoundland because we don't have a lot of records. Um, so it may not be 100% accurate, but it's certainly a very educated guess and it's better than nothing. So we'll probably be able to refine some of those breeding periods after the Atlas, but for now they should give you an idea of whether something is during its breeding season or outside. Uh, the next possible breeding evidence code is S for singing. So a singing male or an adult producing other sounds associated with breeding. So an example of that might be a spruce grouse drumming, or um, those of you who came to the owl talk might remember that Wilson Snipe do a display flight where they dive and the wind passing over their outer tail feathers sounds a lot like a boreal owl. Um, that would be an example of S. So the bird is not singing, it's making the sound with its feathers. Uh, however, that is still a sound associated with breeding. Um, so this would be a possible breeding evidence code. 
And so our example here is a bay-breasted warbler singing during the breeding season. So there are only two possible codes, and then we move on to the next level. And that's our probable codes, and there are a lot of these. So let's say what you have is a bird singing, but during one visit, you have eight individuals, eight different individuals of that species singing. So we, here we have eight savanna sparrows singing during breeding season, all on the same visit. That we give a different code. So that is multiple. Uh, seven or more individuals heard during one visit to a single square in suitable nesting habitat. Um, so if you've got a whole bunch of birds singing, the chances that one of them is breeding in the area become a little bit higher. Uh, also, if you observe a pair, um, now that's not always possible to tell for birds that are not so sexually dimorphic. It's really hard to tell if you have two birds together or if you have a male and female. But for birds that are sexually dimorphic, for example, like our Barrow's golden eye here, uh, this male and female, you can tell clearly you've got two members, uh, you've got two members of the opposite sex, uh, you see the pair together, that would get a P for probable breeding. I'm going to stick a little asterisk next to that, and we will come back to it after we've gone through the codes. Uh, our next probable code is T. And I actually don't have an example for this because it's a time code rather than a space code. Um, so it, let's say you have an adult bird singing. You have a savanna sparrow singing, for example. You don't have eight in one square. But what you do know is that the bird is sitting, uh, that example was on a roof singing. And let's say you come back a week later and that bird is still on the same roof singing. Now you can't know for sure that it's the same bird, but it's in the same place. So there's a pretty good chance. That suggests the presence of a territory. And so if you have a bird that is sort of um, displaying in some way that you would normally give an S code, but you've seen what is likely the same bird in the same place uh, on two separate visits that are at least a week apart, that gets the code of T. Um, so you do need to use a little bit of discretion with this code. Uh, so for example, some species might hang out a long distance from their nesting site. So for example, some turkey vultures, but generally speaking, particularly with small songbirds, if you see them displaying in the same area, two weeks running, then you can give them a code T. Um, another probable code is D. So courtship or displays that involve either a male or a female. So something like a male feeding the female uh, or copulating, or antagonistic behavior. So you can see, uh, for example, a chase between two individuals, two males or two females. Um, those are both territorial disputes or displays, uh, and so that you would give a code D. Uh, and so our example here is a male spruce grouse displaying to a female. Now, some of you may have remembered that I said, if you hear, I think I said rough grouse drumming, but um, so drumming is an example of a display, but you don't know if that display is being given to a female because you're not seeing the bird. So in this case, this male spruce grouse is clearly displaying to the female. There is a female there. Uh, so you would give it a D for probable breeding because it is a breeding display. Um, we have the code V, again, probable, and that is a bird, a bird visiting a probable nest site in suitable nesting habitat during the breeding season. So here, for example, we have a black-capped chickadee. Uh, we know that they are cavity breeders. They breed in holes in trees. And so this chickadee is clearly checking out the cavity. And, but then if you don't see it again later, it probably didn't build a nest there, but it was certainly investigating that cavity. And so you would give it a V. Um, agitated behavior or alarm calls uh, of an adult in nesting habitat during the breeding season, you would give a code of A. Again, probable breeding. Uh, and so this is one of my favorite examples uh, because greater yellow legs are great for this. They tend to perch at the top of conifers and just sort of alarm call constantly at you. So I have a lot of greater yellow legs uh, with probable or with A codes in my notebook. This is a code that to be honest, you will probably never use, uh, but I include it because it is on our sheet. And so I just wanted to touch on it. Um, a brood plat patch or a cloacal protuberance. Uh, so when birds are, when females, or I should say when whichever bird sits on the nest is breeding, they will actually lose the feathers on their breast and belly, as you can see in this example here, and it becomes highly vascularized and warm and squishy for incubation. Um, so that would be a, blue, a brood patch. 
Uh, males cloaca can also fill up with sperm and then they, be, they, they protrude. That's a cloacal protuberance. You really need a bird in your hand to have uh, to be able to see either of those. Uh, but this is a brood patch on a bank swallow. So you would give that probable breeding. Uh, the only time I've ever used it in the field is when I found a dead bird a few years ago that did have a brood patch. Uh, because then that, that was clearly in my hand and I could see that there was a brood patch. And this is our last probable breeding code, and that is N. So nest building by wrens or nest hole excavation by woodpeckers. And this is specific to wrens and woodpeckers. So this is our example here is a downy woodpecker excavating a cavity. The reason it's specific to those two groups of birds is because both of them will build what is called dummy nests. So they will excavate more cavities, and in the case of wrens, fill those extra cavities with sticks, but not actually be nesting in there. So they have their own special category. And now we move into our confirmed breeding evidence codes. Um, so you'll notice that all of these confirmed codes are two letters, and that's how you can tell the difference between the confirmed codes and the possible and probable codes. Uh, so the first one is NB, so nest building, including the carrying of nesting material, by everything except wrens and woodpeckers. Um, so in our example here, we have a purple finch female carrying nesting material. So I know she's building a nest nearby. Uh, so we have confirmed breeding. Um, this is another display code, but rather than territorial displays, we're talking about distraction displays. So uh, like some of the shorebirds we talked about, including this killdeer uh, that will fake broken wings to draw you away from a nest. There's really no other reason for them to do that, except if they have nestlings, so that is considered confirmed breeding. NU is for finding an empty used nest or identifiable eggshells from earlier in the same nesting season. And I have a use with caution here. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is it can be difficult with nests particularly to be sure that it actually has been used that same breeding season. Um, so I, for example, am pretty sure that this was a used nest of a chipping sparrow, uh, but that is because I there were fledglings in the area, and by in the area, I mean about, you know, three inches away, uh, and it doesn't look particularly weathered. But not only is it sometimes difficult to tell whether you have a nest from the current season, it's also sometimes difficult to identify a nest or even eggshells to species unless they are very identifiable. So you can use the NU code. You will always get a warning from the system just to make sure that you've thought these things through. Um, another confirmed breeding code. So recently fledged young or downy young, uh, basically birds that are incapable of sustained flight. So this horned lark uh, is an FY because he clearly has not been traveling too far. He's still growing in his feathers. The reason that it's important that they really aren't capable of sustained flight is because it's not enough to say, oh, there's a horn lark breeding. We want to know for sure that it bred within the square um, because we are now saying, okay, horned lark breed within this square. Uh, and so we want things that can't have wandered too far from where they were hatched. Um, our Another breeding evidence code, and we're sort of getting up in degrees of certainty here, uh, so if you see an adult entering, occupying, or leaving a nest site. Um, so for example, if you were to see this robin sitting on a nest, or in fact it had entered from just above, you can see in the upper left picture there. Um, so in that case, you know that obviously that bird is breeding in the area. You found the nest, there's a bird sitting on it. Um, adults carrying fecal sacs. So uh, some of you may know that when young birds poop, when fledgling or when nestlings poop in a nest, they most often poop inside this gelatinous sack. Uh, and the adults will actually clean the nest. So they'll sanitize the nest by taking those sacks away. And so if you see an adult bird, like this female red winged blackbird, carrying one of these fecal sacks, that is confirmed breeding, even if you can't see exactly where she came from. Similarly, an adult carrying food for its young, like our Wilson's warbler here that would be confirmed breeding. There is no other reason for the Wilson's warbler to be carrying food, so you don't need to follow it to its nest. You can just say, okay, it has food, confirmed breeding. Uh, and I think Jenna would agree that this is the most common confirmed breeding code we use in the field. Uh, if you find a nest with eggs in it, like our American pipit nest here, obviously confirmed breeding. And weirdly enough, if you find a nest with young in it, that is also confirmed breeding, so that is NY. So, 
we started with the least uh, sure breeding codes are, and, and we moved up into codes that, you know, become better and better evidence of breeding. And so generally speaking, when you're out birding, we like to get the highest breeding code possible. So you don't need to find a nest, but if you can find, if you can keep observing until you get a confirmed breeding code, that's really what we're looking for. Okay, so I said, we are going to do a two part uh, quiz today. Um, so we have five questions, but each question has two parts. The first part is a, what species is this? So who do we have here? And you should be able to vote. Has it popped up? I'm not seeing any, oh, okay, people are voting now, excellent. Okay, anybody else want to add their guess to this? We're at 65% participation. I'll just hop in and say that if the poll window is covering up the picture, um, you should be able to drag it around your computer or whatever device screen that you're using uh, to see the things hidden. Thank you, Jenna. Okay, we're at 72% participation. Any more guesses? Okay. Uh, I'm going to end the poll, uh, but the majority of you, almost 90% did get this right. This is an American Robin. Um, it's a really good way of illustrating that young birds can look a little bit different from the parents. So you see that nice robin redbreast there, but it has a lot of those spots that we associate with other uh, thrush species. And generally speaking, you often see more spots and streaks on young birds. One of the ways that you can tell that this is a young bird is if you look at the corners of his bill there, you can actually see a little bit of the fleshy gape still left. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but right along in there you've got a little bit of, um, of of fleshiness and so that's sort of the leftover baby bird gape. So I'm going to stop sharing this one and this is the behavioral observation that goes with our American robin. So a young American robin barely able to fly is seen hopping about on a lawn. So the next question is what breeding code would you use for this guy? And I've given you four options there. And so far we've got one option coming in. Everybody seems pretty sure about this one. Okay. Anybody else wanna hazard a guess? All right, I'm gonna close the poll and I will share it. So uh, the overwhelming majority of you said FY, and that is the same code that I would give this. A few of you said X, so species without breeding evidence, basically. And that is fair. If this young robin were able to fly further and you, you weren't so sure anymore that it had been hatched nearby, then X would be appropriate. However, in this case, because this guy cannot have moved very far from where he hatched, uh, then you, you can be pretty sure that he he was hatched in the square and you would give him an FY or confirmed breeding. Okay, so I'll go on to our next question. And again, start with who do we have here? And these are drawn from all of our weeks, so they may be a little bit harder than, than they normally are. That being said, people seem pretty sure of this one. Okay. And I'll just take a few last, last guesses. We've got more than 60% of people have made a guess. So last call for guesses, anyone else? Okay. So uh, again, the majority did get this right. This is a barn swallow. Um, 
I gave you the three swallow species that we have in Newfoundland to be a little bit tricky. Uh, if it were a bank swallow, we would see a white underneath and a white throat with just a single band of brown across the chest. Uh, we also wouldn't see the same long tail. If it were a tree swallow, we would see the same glossy blue on the black back, but again, we would have a white underneath um, and a white throat there. An eastern kingbird would have the same sort of color pattern as a tree swallow. Um, so you would see that the dark back, it's more of a grayish as opposed to iridescent blue in the tree swallow and a white underneath. Um, it would also be sitting more upright on the wire. So uh, kingbirds are flycatchers and they tend to have that upright flycatcher posture. Okay, so in this case, the behavioral observation that goes with it is we observe a barn swallow flying into a barn. So what breeding code would you use for the, this particular barn swallow? This one's a bit trickier. People seem a little bit more split. Okay. Any final guesses? A few more people are throwing their hat in the ring. Anyone else? Okay, I'm gonna end the poll there, share the results. Like I say, a lot more mixed here. Um, a small majority, 44% of you, picked the code that I would use, which is visiting a probable nest site. But I can see uh, different, I can, I can see arguments for almost all of them. So I can see habitat as an argument, the age, uh, because we know it's the right breeding habitat. We know it's during the breeding season. Uh, you haven't really seen any direct evidence of breeding. So I can see why age would be a choice. And also we know that barn swallows nest in barns, so I can see why you might consider that an adult leaving or entering a nest site. Um, however, we don't know for sure there's a nest in there, um, but we do have better evidence than just a barn swallow flying around over some fields because we know that barn swallows build their mud nests on human structures for the most part. So we tend to find them under bridges and in barns. And so it's really kind of the same thing as a chickadee visiting a cavity. It's a V for visiting probable nest site. Okay, so just a few more. And again, starting with our, okay, is there some reason it's decided I can't launch polls? Jenna, I might need you to launch this one because it's refusing to let me. Can you do 3A for me? Uh, yeah, I just have to stop sharing the other one and then I think it works. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so what species do we have here? Some people are again very sure, jumping right in there. Okay, any more guesses? I'm going to end this relatively soon because. I don't want to keep you guys too late tonight, and we do have a few more slides to go through. Um, okay, so if we end the poll here, share the results. So 79% of you uh, said common merganser, and you are in fact correct. So we know from the um, from the shape of the head and from the shape of the bill, we know that we have a merganser here. So instead of that relatively wide, often short bill of ducks, we've got that long narrow merganser bill. Uh, so then you've got our two species of merganser, the common merganser and the red-breasted merganser. And I mean, I think your biggest clue here is that it does not have a red breast. Uh, so that right there will tell you that you're not dealing with the red-breasted merganser, you're dealing with the common merganser. So then our next question is, you see a pair of mergansers during, and you see them copulating during spring migration. So, what breeding code would you use for this pair of mergansers? Okay. So we've got an overwhelming answer and then some other 
uh, we've got a little bit of spread across the other ones. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll here, share the results. Most of you said D, courtship display, including interaction between a male and a female or between two members of the same sex. Normally you would be right. This is a trick question. So normally if you see a pair of birds copulating, you would in fact put it down as a D. Ducks are an exception, and that is because they pair on the wintering grounds. And so they can migrate already paired, and you can see things like courtship displays uh, or copulation during migration. And so in fact, the correct answer for this one is actually X, species observed in its breeding season, but no breeding evidence. You wouldn't even give it a P, as frustrating as it would be, and that's why I said put an asterisk by that pair of Barrow's golden eyes that we use, because it's actually a terrible example. Um, if they, because they can pair on migration, you cannot necessarily be sure unless it is outside of the migration season that you have uh, a courtship display or a pair. Okay, a couple more, and I think that was the trickiest of the lot. Uh, so our first question here, Jenna, I think you might have to close yours again or, um, it, oh, there we go. Okay, yes. Uh, so who do we have here? Okay, get your guesses in. Very split on this one. It's a tricky one for sure. And I will say it's one you're much more likely to hear than you are to see. I'm not sure how Randall White got this amazing photo because I chased these guys around all summer and got only one blurry photo. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll now, share the results. Uh, so this is, in fact, a winter wren. 43% of you got that right. 29% uh, of you guessed house wren. Good guess. Again, I was being tricky. Uh, so you can tell that it's a wren by that very upright tail posture. That's very characteristic of wrens. They hold their tails directly erect. Uh, however, we don't actually have house wrens in Newfoundland. Uh, we only have winter wrens. Um, oven bird, you would see a brown and orange striped top and on a Lincoln Sparrow you would see streaky on the breast and on neither of them would you have that that tail standing right up in the air like that. Uh, so let's, this is our winter wren and our breeding observation or our behavioral observation is it's seen carrying twigs and hair into a nest box. So what breeding code would you use? And I think this one's a little bit easier. Okay, so final guesses, get your guesses in. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll. Uh, so the majority of you do have this one right. It is N, nest building or excavation by a wren or woodpecker. So nest building includes carrying nesting material like twigs and hair. That is what wrens build their nests out of. Um, however, we can't go to our confirmed breeding code, NB, because wrens and woodpeckers specifically build dummy nests. So he might be basically faking us out. So he's stuffing a hole full of sticks and twigs and hair, uh, but that's not where actually the eggs are going to be. So N is this special code just for uh, woodpeckers and wrens. Okay, and we have one more set of questions. So first question, who do we have? What species do we have here? Okay, any more guesses? Okay, I'm gonna end the poll there. Get your final guess is in. Okay, so we got a little bit of everything, but our two most popular answers were crow and raven. And does anyone remember 
when you're standing underneath a crow or raven like this, what the way is to tell the difference between them. And just unmute yourself and yell it out if you know, or you can put it in the chat. Donna, if you can tell me if anyone puts it in the chat. What's the way to tell the difference between a raven and a crow when you're standing underneath them? V-shaped tail for a raven. You got it. So for a raven, you would expect a diamond-shaped tail. And on a crow, you get a fan-shaped tail like this. On a grackle, also a big black bird, um, you would expect a longer tail and more iridescence. And a rusty blackbird would be a smaller bird overall. So thank you, Judy. You got it right. Uh, so this is indeed an American crow. And this particular American crow we observe in May flying around with food in its bill. Um, so what breeding code would you use for this bird? Okay, we're 50% participation. This is the last question for today. So I'm gonna shut it down in a minute. Okay, last guess is in now. All right, so this is a tricky one and I, I finished with a really tricky one here. Um, so a lot of you said adult carrying food for young. Again, with almost anything that isn't a crow, that would be true. Not everything, but most things carrying food are carrying them for young. Unfortunately for us, crows will actually carry food for themselves. And so just because we see a crow carrying food, we cannot assume that it is um, carrying it for a mate, so courtship feeding, or carrying it for its young. And so unfortunately, when we see a crow carrying food, we actually just have to go with H. Um, so we don't have any stronger evidence than it's in suitable habitat. Now, some of you answered X and you may be wondering how I said in suitable habitat. Uh, the reason I said in suitable habitat is just that crows are really good at breeding pretty much anywhere. Uh, so most places are suitable habitat for crows. Okay, so we did some of the trickier ones there. It is often a lot easier than that. Um, but just, and I know we're over time, so of course I understand if you have to leave, I just have a few more slides to talk a little bit about these codes. Uh, we do have two sort of categories of questionable codes. One is invalid codes, um, and these are codes that the system will not accept, uh, but that doesn't actually mean that they are necessarily impossible. So if you try and put these in, the computer will not let you, and you'll have to put it in as a comment, but that doesn't mean that you haven't seen what you've seen in a lot of cases. Um, so an example of an invalid code would be carrying food for a crow. Um, it would be carrying food for most precocial species. So species, that's, that's where the young, when they hatch, they, they dry their downy feathers pretty quickly and they're out of the nest. So our shorebirds are really good examples of precocial young. Um, it's unlikely that you would see the adult carrying food. Similarly, for most of our seabird species, uh, the parents feed their young by regurgitating food. So you wouldn't actually see them carrying it in a lot of cases. Um, another example for brown-headed cowbirds, for example, which we don't actually have in Newfoundland, uh, but they are nest parasites. Um, and so if you were to say that you saw a brown-headed cowbird building a nest, something would definitely be wrong there. And the system would say, no, hang on a second, brown-headed cowbirds don't build a nest. Uh, you get a similar response if you said that for a shorebird that, for example, doesn't build a nest, but just makes a scrape with its body. We also have improbable codes. So these are codes that are unlikely and the computer will give you a warning when you try and enter the data, but it does not mean that it could never happen. And examples for that, you will always get uh, a warning when you use that NU code um, because most nests and eggshells are not unique. Uh, but for example, I have put in NU for robin eggshells uh, because they are quite, quite evidently robin eggshells. Um, CF for some species, okay, so sorry, you would get an improbable code for a crow. Um, it's not that you haven't seen that the crow carrying food, it's just that it's not necessarily doing so for its young. Um, and some species feed mates during the courtship. So for example, the tern. And so it's difficult to know when you see a tern carrying food, is that for its young or is it in fact a D for a courtship display or feeding? How do you know? You actually get this experience by trying trying the atlasing out. So um, particularly if you use our app, which you can put on your phone, 
very easily, it will actually give you this feedback in real time. Um, so it will actually tell you, you don't need to know everything about every bird species. The app will actually provide that feedback. Uh, the last thing that I really wanted to touch on here is for some species, uh, our rare and colonial species. So this is mostly our species at risk and our colonial seabirds. These are species that we ask for a little bit extra information about. So we ask for a description of the bird or the colony, uh, how familiar you are with the species. So how sure are you, you saw this species. Um, this extra documentation just helps us confirm the identification and provides information about the colony. Uh, and we ask that if you can, you take photos or make recordings. That's not always possible, but if you can, it helps back up what you're saying. So ultimately, uh, this is really what we're aiming to do. We're aiming to make a map like this, with this one is for the black and white warbler from the Manitoba Atlas. We're aiming to do that for all of the species that breed on the island of Newfoundland. It's obviously a huge amount of work. Um, and I just kind of want to finish with a little bit of a pitch for why we're doing it. Um, obviously, birding is fun, uh, but it also is a really important way to monitor and evaluate the health of both our species, our bird species, and also because bird species tell us about the health of the ecosystem, it's a great way to monitor ecosystem health. Uh, it's cost effective because we have so many different people contributing to the observations. Uh, it is scientifically rigorous, so Atlas protocols have been developed and are used and are done the same way across North America, Europe, um, and it is repeatable. So breeding bird atlases are actually intended to be repeated every 20 years. And what that gives us is a really good way of tracking what's going on with bird populations. And so I have an example here taken from the first Maritime Breeding Bird Atlas, which was done uh, between 1990 and 1994, I believe. And the second, no, sorry, I got that wrong, 86 and 90. And the second one was done between 2006 and 2010. Uh, and so what we've got here is the probability of observation for barn swallows in the first atlas, so in the late 80s, and then in the second atlas in the late 2000s. And you don't need this third map, which is the difference between them, to tell that you are much more, you were much more likely to see a barn swallow during the first atlas than you were during the second. So you see a pretty significant decline there, particularly in northern New Brunswick. It's not always a bad news story, though. So we have the same maps for the blue-headed vireo. And you can see that in New Brunswick and some parts of Nova Scotia, you were actually more likely to see a blue-headed vireo during the second atlas than you were during the first. So what this gives us is a way to track what's going on with bird populations um, and uh, identify declines of concern like those with our aerial insectivores, see where we're having successful uh, success with our conservation measures, that kind of thing. Um, what we hope this atlas will be, and I think is maybe particularly important, um, given uh, recent changes to development in Newfoundland, it can be a conservation tool because it can be used to inform land development policies. Um, so because, again, we can't protect things if we don't know what's there. So this is the first step. We need to know what's there to make smart decisions. Uh, and then finally, atlases are also great because they're citizen science tools and they are a fantastic way to get people outside and excited about birds. Uh, and I really, really want to stress that you do not have to be an expert to atlas. Uh, so this is the species map for the American robin there. You'll see that there are plenty of places in Newfoundland where we have no records of American robins. I don't think that means there, no, there are no American robins there. I think it means we haven't had them reported yet. Uh, in my personal experience, robins are almost everywhere on this island. Uh, so if the only thing you recognize is a robin, but there is a robin building a nest above your cabin door, that is information we want. Uh, and another species I chose to highlight here is the horned lark. It's not quite as common as the robin, uh, but you will remember that we've talked about horned larks. And if you can see their little yellow and black faces and their little horn feathers, uh, they're really recognizable. Uh, they tend to breed in sort of barren open areas. And you can see the larks have been reported around Cape St. Mary's and on the coastal barrens on the Avalon. But I suspect we have many more places where you can find horned larks in Newfoundland. Um, and so th this is a map that you could easily help to fill, fill in. Uh, as I said, we're now three years in. We have 203 people registered for the Atlas who together have put in more than 6,500 hours in 612 squares. So our coverage map is really starting to fill out and it's really amazing to see. Um, so far, we have records for 180 species on the island. Uh, and those, every, every time you go out birding, uh, assuming it's not an incidental uh, report, 
basically, if you're out general atlasing, you, you are submitting what's called a checklist at the end of that general atlasing period, whether it be five minutes or five hours. Uh, and so we have more than 7,000 checklists that have been submitted for the atlas. So finally, I'll just say if, uh, if you have inspired you tonight and you're interested in joining us, you can go to nfbirdatlas.ca. Right at the top there, there's a join button. It will take you to this uh, slightly different looking webpage, which is our Nature Counts webpage. You want to sign up for the project. And once you've signed up for the project, you are able to uh, access resources like these Atlas Square resources. Uh, so you can download those PDF maps that show you the different habitat types and uh, where you can do your point counts and that kind of thing through the Atlas Square resources. So the key points for atlasing, this is second last slide here. Um, if you're not sure what you're seeing, if you don't know what species it is, don't submit it. Bird ethically. Um, so there is an entire statement on our webpage about birding ethically, uh, but basically what it means is respecting other birders and respecting the birds themselves, so not stressing them out. Uh, always get permission if you are accessing private land. That's not as much of an issue in Newfoundland, but it is sometimes an issue. Uh, be respectful be safe and have fun. This is a really fun project and atlasing is amazingly addictive. And so finally, again, we just, we need your help to put Newfoundland's birds on the map. Um, we got two more years to fill in all of those blank spots on the map. So I really hope that you will help us. And I will stop there for tonight, but I'm open to any questions. Uh, if there are any that Jenna hasn't been able to get to yet in the chat. Thanks a bunch, Catherine. Um, there was a couple questions that I wanted to bring up out loud um, for more clarification. Um, so the first one is uh, you were talking about the pair of mergansers and saying that you wouldn't use a P code. So um, could you just explain that a little bit more? Right. So because, I mean, Jenna, you can jump in here too, because I, I sort of feel like I'm saying the same thing. Uh, so if you have a better explanation, I'm all ears. But essentially, the problem is that most birds show up on their breeding territories and then attract a mate. And so if you see them together as a pair, you know that they are breeding there. However, with ducks, including mergansers, they will actually pair up on their wintering grounds and then they will migrate as a pair, hanging out together, copulating, displaying along the way. So if it is during the season where you would still be expecting migratory birds, and so I believe that question actually specifically said you see them copulating, but it's during the spring migration period. Just because they are together as a pair, you cannot assume that they are breeding in that square right there. You can assume that they are breeding with each other whenever they get to wherever their breeding grounds are, but we can't assume, we can't tie it to a location, which is a really important part of the atlas, because when we submit that observation, we're saying that breeding is happening right here. So what you would want to do is wait until after the migration period is over for that species. Then you go back to the pond. If you still see that pair of mergansers, you could put them in as a P or you could put them in as a D if you see them copulating. Uh, but until we can tie it to that location, uh, we don't want to put them in as, as breeding evidence. Jenna, would you explain it a different way or does that? No, I think, I think that hits the key point. Um... Oh, so here's maybe here's a follow up then. So they may continue together to some other location than the ducks, but they are together. They're just traveling. And yes, that's right. Yes, so the, that is exactly <laughs> it. They are a pair, yep. but you can't say that they are a pair at that location. So that's kind of where the, the key distinction comes in. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. Thanks for that clarification. Um, and then there was somebody who asked about um, what you do if you're sort of at the boundary of two squares. Um, and you have maybe a fledgling in that square, can you assume it's from there or maybe you came from a different area? That is a great question. And actually that also raises another point that I should have mentioned. So on our website, on our Atlas website, there is actually an Atlas in quiz, which takes you through a lot of these tricky questions. Um, and a lot of those, those quiz questions are about uh, birds that you see at the boundary of a square. Um, generally speaking, you report it in the square that you saw it in. Uh, with a fledgling close to the boundary, you're right, it may have come from the next square over. There's really nothing you can do about that. What you don't want to do is report it in both squares. So if, for example, it then moves into the next square, you, you want to pick one square and report it in that. You don't want to report it in both. Um, and 
I mean, you're right, that does introduce some potential error into the atlas. Um, however, if that square or the next square over are colored red, ultimately it probably doesn't make a huge difference um, because we know that that fledgling came from that area right there. Uh, but yeah, the boundary issue does introduce some problems. Thanks for that. Um, and then Amira just has a, another follow-up about the ducks question. Um, so you'd wait to see chicks or ducklings um, to put a code to them. And I guess the answer is um, once it's actually the breeding season um, and outside of the migration period. And so that's information you can get out of that calendar that Catherine was talking about. Um, then you could use the P for pair or I mean, definitely later in a year, if you saw ducklings there, then that's even better to put in that um, confirmed breeding code as well. Yes, generally, if you see ducklings there, that would be a better breeding code anyway than pairs. So that would be more exciting. We like our confirmed breeding codes. Mm -hmm. um, and then another question just came in from Janet. Uh, the square target of 12 to 20 hours. Can you clarify whether or not it matters if you exceed 20 hours? It does not matter if you exceed 20 hours. However, the reason we put an upper limit on it is because ideally, once you've hit 20 hours, you wanna move over into a different square. Um, because we have so much area to cover and so little time to do it in, the upper limit is really meant to say, okay, I think we're good in this square now. It would be great if you can move your attention elsewhere. However, we certainly have squares that have exceeded that amount of coverage. Uh, so, for example, there are a few squares around St. John's and uh, the square that Gander is in because people live there and are often birding there. You know, they're, they've got 60, 70 hours of coverage and that's fine. But if you're trying to decide where to bird, then ideally you would uh, you would choose a different square. Great. Um, and then we have another question in the chat just now. Um, since a fledgling can move across boundaries, do you try to have both squares done in the same day or anything like that or coordinate across squares between people? Not necessarily, no. Um, so it's that boundary issue again. And, and it's funny because I've really emphasized how important it is to tie things to a location and it is, but you know, it doesn't necessarily, there, there is some innate error here. So it doesn't necessarily matter whether you report that fledgling for one square or the adjacent square. And if two people report a fledgling in those two squares, I mean, these circumstances where you would have two people out in an adjacent square on different days seeing the same fledgling, it's, it's unlikely. Um, but I guess the other part of that answer is our priority squares are spaced such that you never have, you almost never have two priority squares adjacent to each other. So chances are that next door square wouldn't actually even, ideally we wouldn't have somebody assigned to that. Perfect. Um, I don't see any more coming in right now. So there was two others that I wanted to come back to from earlier. Um, and someone asked, I can't remember who it was and they're maybe gone now, but anyway, if they're still here, um, if they wanted to buy a handheld recorder, um, what's, um, do, they, do we have any recommendations for a brand to purchase or a unit to purchase? And I couldn't remember what ours were, so. <laughs> yeah, ours are Zoom H2N handy recorders. Um, for the Atlas, we do actually need people to use those recorders uh, because they are very high quality and they record extremely high quality sound and they record in stereo, which is really important for us uh, because what it lets us do is get a sense of the number of birds by letting us get a sense of where the birds are relative to the, the microphone. Um, Zoom H2Ns are great in that they're very small, compact, and relatively speaking, they're your best bang for buck. Uh, they're not crazy expensive for the quality that you get. However, they are about $250 to $300 a piece. Uh, so there are much cheaper recorders you can get, but uh, I would probably advise a Zoom if you're gonna invest in a recorder. Um, and I guess it depends if you're planning on just using it for your own personal use or or not, because um, there might be others that are cheaper, but good enough for what you want it for. Personally. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and then there was just one other sort of discussion we'd been having in the chat. Someone was wondering if there's a group of birders or a Facebook group or a meetup group on the Avalon Peninsula that they can meet people to um, go birding. And I mentioned the Sunday morning bird box at the Munn Botanical Gardens. 
Um, and Catherine, I didn't know if you had any other suggestions. Um, um so there well. are there there is a WhatsApp group for rare bird sightings, and there is also a um, nf.birds Google group. Um, usually those are for unusual bird sightings, but if you're looking for someone to go birding with, I suspect you could put that in a post in the NF Birds Google group and people would be interested in going out with you. Um, the other thing that I will just throw out there is that we are going to be hosting a number of bird walks ourselves on the Avalon. Uh, so for World Migratory Bird Day on May 13th, we're gonna be doing one in Bay Roberts. Uh, and then on probably the 1st of June, we're gonna be doing one in Harbor Grace. Um, and also we're going to be doing a bird walk and Zoom recorder tutorial training uh, on, Jenna, am I crazy if I say May the 9th? I think it's May the 9th. All of those will be showing up on our website and Facebook soon. So you don't have to remember those dates or take my word for them because uh, my brain, the map, or the calendar in my brain may be a bit scrambled right now. Um, but yeah, there are options to go out on bird walks as well. But I would say the Google group is a good bet. Great, thank you. Um, I think that was all the questions that I had written down from earlier. So if anyone has anything else, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask or type it in the chat now. Um, but otherwise, we had lots of thanks again, Catherine. Interesting presentation. And this has been great. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for those of us, those of you who have stuck it out right until the very end. Uh, and hopefully we see you next week for Jenna's uh, Birding by Ear webinar, which will be awesome. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Have a good night, everyone. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Jenna.